So thank you for being here today. I want to talk about the future of digital service delivery. And you just heard a little bit about me. The, the bottom line is that I spent a lot of my time asking questions and listening, whether it is behind the one-way mirror in a focus group room, or talking to people in settings like this, or talking to users all over the country, and trying to understand where are they, what are they thinking about, what do they want, what's coming next with technology, and how ultimately can government create services that are going to make their lives better and easier. That's my goal, and that's what I do all day, and that's what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. But first, I want to go back 10 years. I don't know if any of you remember these. This was my Palm Trio. I loved my Palm Trio. This thing at the time was fantastic. Let's ignore the fact that right now, functionally, it's probably the equivalent of a brick. But I could talk on the phone. If the stars lined up, I could also look at my email. And if I were in a magnetic hotspot, I could even get access to the internet. And at the time, I thought, this was amazing in 2007. Well, what happened roughly one week ago, 10 years ago, is a, a small company called Apple introduced a new way of using mobile devices. And as mm, all of you, I'm assuming, know, they came out last year or last week and celebrated their 10 year anniversary. So things very dramatically changed. So what does that look like? Well, thanks to the devices that we have in this interconnected world, the system that manages my house knows when I leave and turns the temperature down. It can unlock and lock the doors remotely based upon a button that I push on my phone. When I'm traveling, my phone understands where I'm going and will often text me rerouted information based upon traffic and construction situations. When I landed yesterday, very late at Dulles, Delta Airlines sent me a text welcoming me to Dulles, told me where I could pick up my Uber, and even mapped the closest path to get to my hotel here in the district. There are so many ways in which technology is dramatically changing how we think, how we function, and, and vastly simplifying. And so the challenge and the opportunity is, okay, how do we take that, and how do we make it better for citizens and businesses in the world in which we're serving them through government? So the bottom line is that the future is already here. What I'm talking about, those scenarios I just talked about 10 years ago on my trio would have just seemed like something from a fantasy film, but it's here. And let's talk about a few of them, one of which is natural language processing. And this is basically what I like to say, say goodbye to the keyboard. It's going away because we can talk and things will happen. So an excellent example of this is a service called Hound. I'm not sure if you've used it before. I tried it the other day and I said, Hound, I'm going to Washington DC and I need a hotel. I'm going to be staying the night of September 18th. I'm going to be speaking at Sydney Harmon Hall. So I need a hotel within one mile or two metro stops from Sydney Harmon Hall. I understand it's Washington DC, but I would love to get a hotel for under $300 that doesn't have me sleeping in a soggy refrigerator crate. And I would ideally like it to also have a fitness center, free Wi-Fi, and room service that's open all night because I'm gonna be landing at midnight. And Hound processed that and gave me three hotels. That could have taken 10 minutes, 15 minutes with internet searches, looking at different websites, clicking on boxes, etc. So again, natural language processing. We talk, things happen. Now let's talk a little bit about conversations like conversational interfaces and chatbots. There's this great story from Georgia Tech where a professor had roughly 300 students in a big lecture class. He had eight TAs, but he calculated that across all of these 300 students, they were generating roughly 10,000 questions per semester and completely overwhelming his TAs. Uh, you know, I'm a marketer, so I'm not a math major, so I had to put this into my phone, but I think it works out to 10,000 questions, eight TAs. It's roughly 1,250 questions per teaching assistant per semester. So thankfully, this professor also happened to be running a master's class in artificial intelligence. And he said, you know what? I'm going to develop a chatbot solution that is going to predetermine the top 30 questions that we're getting repeatedly based upon what my TAs are telling me. 
and we're going to set it up so that when people email, they're going to talk to the chatbot first, and let's see how many of these questions we can offload. And what happened was roughly 4,000 questions in a full semester were able to be handled through a chatbot solution. But as you can see on the screen, the chatbot, which was using IBM's Watson technology, the chatbot's name, of course, very creatively, was Jill Watson. Um, she was a bit wordy and didn't exactly answer some of the questions. And the student at the bottom says, I'm beginning to wonder if Jill is a computer. However, there are ways to do this so that you can provide data-based answers, fact-based answers, and these are things that our offices around the country that are serving state and local and federal government agencies are starting to test to understand how can we best migrate traffic away from a human if there's a fast, easy, to-the-point solution. I also want to talk about conversational interfaces, but I have to be very careful about what I call it because I have one sitting right here, but if I speak inappropriately, it's going to start chatting. It's kind of mouthy, but at any rate, Amazon has a product, which you can see, ask dot, 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 and we're testing this in our state of Utah portal. We're also testing it in the state of Mississippi, and we're saying all this great content exists on websites, but how do we make it more available for a conversational interface like this product? So I'd like to test for you and show you what we're doing in the state of Utah. And through the magic of double mics, I think this will work. Alexa, open Utah Fishing. Which fishing spot would you like a report for? Or say help. Strawberry Reservoir. Fishing at Strawberry Reservoir is currently good. Fish for cutthroat trout, rainbow trout kokani salmon, smallmouth bass. Anglers are catching rainbows, cutthroats, okay. and kokani salmon. Alexa, for stop. It would keep going. <laughs> Alexa, thank you. Sure. Okay. Um. She's super polite, and she, I always, I'm telling my kids, you always have to thank Alexa. She has feelings, too, and when you thank her, she says about six different things, like, no problem, got it. This is really important, and I will also tell you, if we kept going, it would have walked through the types of lines and lures, the best bait, what types of fish were biting at which uh, depths, best temperature, best times of day, it goes on and on, and this is simply text that can be programmed in. We can scrape information off of existing websites. This site has been remarkably popular. It was something that our team came up with just to try it. But as we've been marketing it across the state of Utah, we're finding that people who fish, when they're getting ready in the morning, are more than happy to ask Alexa to tell them what they need to do rather than looking at their phones, looking at a computer screen. So again, keyboards could go away, screens could go away, we could be talking and getting information back. So this is a test, this is the first phase. What's coming next is let's have seamless transactions. I would love to renew my driver's license. I've got the information right here. I don't need to go in for a vision test. Alexa, can you take care of that for me? You can leverage my stored payment on my device. Boom, we're done. That is the way of the future. So, but what about, I'm talking about all this stuff that's happening now but moving in the future. What about those fundamentals, those blocking and tackling pieces that really matter? And it's important for me to stop and say, you're right. There are so many things we still should be doing. So a great case in point, school just started. How many of you have children who ride a school bus? I'm basically blinded by all these lights, but I'm gonna assume at least one or two hands just went up. Just down the road in the state of Maryland, they have introduced a mobile bus inspection app that replaces an offline system that was paper-based. And what this does is it's tablet-driven, and it allows bus inspectors to complete a safety inspection for a bus. It takes half the amount of time. That information is automatically downloaded into a database. And if a bus is not safe to be operated, it is kept at the depot until those repairs are done. As opposed to in the paper-based world, it's very possible that bus could have still been driving around. This has been live in the state of Maryland. It was based on a system we built in Indiana. It's been wildly successful. And it's one of those examples of we're doing important work. We're using technology and mobile tools in order to keep our kids safe. And this also is very relevant nationally because there are instances all over the country where school districts that have extra buses are donating them to Texas and Florida for all those school districts whose buses were flooded during the two hurricanes. So there's a tremendous need for solutions like this. 
What about delivering high demand services like Your Pass Now, which is this fantastic solution that we've built in cooperation with the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service? And what it essentially does is it allows you to buy an entry pass, an annual entry pass, a weekly entry pass, even a single day entry pass at national parks and forests around the country. When I want to talk about high demand, though, we had this fantastic instance roughly a month ago in which the senior pass, which used to be available for $10, had a price increase that the Park Service implemented, and it went up to $80. Last year, in all of 2016, about 33,000 senior passes were sold. In a roughly six-week period in August and early September, excuse me, in July and August, about 630,000 senior passes were sold. And in one day, 79,000 passes were sold and processed through a system. That's a system that needs to be available, it needs to be secure, it needs to be easy to use. That's a high-demand service. Those are important things to do. What about connecting citizens to essential resources? And we've got a great example from our operation at Arkansas.gov. There was a situation there where the entity that supplied or was this clearinghouse for all the scholarships and grant applications for higher education, they had money left on the table every year because students didn't know how to get the money, if the money was even there, and how fast it could happen. And so we built a system that consolidated these 21 granting programs. It was completely digital, and it was also taking a look at the user base. It was mobile-driven, so it was designed for a mobile app and then expanded for what you're seeing on the screen here for a larger screen. What has happened is applications are up 300%. Not a single penny has been left on the table, and roughly $620 million in grants have been given out since 2010 to students who needed the money to get a better, uh, better opportunity in life. That's a great example of connecting citizens to essential resources. And then finally, I want to talk a bit about fixing bait and switch digital processes. And you're going to have to bear with me because this one came up just last week. On the left side of your screen, you're seeing a slightly off kilter, hard to read, paper-based form to renew my dog's pet license. And the dog is on the right-hand side with my daughter. That is my standard poodle, Stella, and my daughter, Sophie. They are partners in crime. I will tell you that the printing of this document actually is off kilter. I didn't do anything. That's how it was sort of slapped on the copier, turn 15 degrees, press print. Completely paper-based. However, at the very bottom, you can barely see it. I mean, it's, it's truly, it's that very bottom line. License your dog online, and then it's got a, you know, 135 character URL. And I thought, great, I'm in digital government. I'm going to go do this. Well, guess what that was? That completely replicated the paper-based process. My dog is eight years old. She has been licensed since she was a puppy. The agency at Summit County Animal Control has all of this information. There's got to be a way to process all of this and at least send me, here's a link to click on, everything's been preloaded, we've got you in our system. No, that's not the way this worked, unfortunately. But there is a way to do that. And Stafford County, Virginia, which is uh, another partner of ours, which is on the way down I-95 towards Richmond, they're running pet licenses where 95% of it is preloaded unless you are an initial, uh, initial uh, licensee. All the renewals are happening you know, roughly in that November, December time period. I think 85% of the renewals seamless takes roughly two minutes. I don't say this to bag too much on Summit County Animal Control because in their defense, two weeks ago, these two clowns here, Stella and Sophie, were out walking my very, un, very poorly behaved poodle broke away and decided to be the unofficial greeter at a 5K as people were running by. <laughs> She's a super happy, super enthusiastic dog, but even when a 50-pound fluffy standard poodle is running at you full speed, people freaked out. But the animal control people cut my daughter a break and did not write her up, so I, I can't totally bash them. And what's important is let's do this in a cost-effective manner. The business model that we use is based on a public-private partnership, 25 years running, 13,000 agencies. It's transaction-based. It's no cost. So the businesses and citizens that take advantage of the services pay a small fee. It only works if the ser services are user-friendly, so we have to deliver services that matter. And so what's next for government technology? I'll give you a hint. Your constituents want to interact differently. And the bottom line is there are 90,000 levels of government entities and agencies, federal, state, city, county, municipal, but how government structured hasn't really changed in about 100 years. 
So what would happen if in the future your device could keep track of everything you needed to do, federal, state, local, push the information to you, asked if it could handle all of your transactions, take advantage of the stored payment. Well, I don't want to tease too much, but my good friend and colleague Angela Fultz Nordstrom will be up in about an hour to talk about that. But it's really going to change the way government delivers services, and it's really exciting. And with that, I have four seconds left, so thank you very much.